And welcome to Pacific Pulse, I'm Tanya Nugent. Coming up, Paris, London, Suva, Fiji's fashion ambitions. A rare insight into the private lives of two Tongan princesses. And a contemporary take on tradition on the catwalk. When it comes to fashion, Polynesia has led the Pacific's push onto the catwalks of Europe and the world stage. Western Samoan designs and motifs became a popular export, quickly establishing the country's emerging design industry. Now, Fiji wants its designers to break into the world of fashion. Here's Clement Paligaru with more. This is the inaugural Fiji Fashion Week, an ambitious event showcasing some of the country's emerging and established designers. It's not all about winning, it's uh, everything, every design is very unique and just showcasing your stuff, that, that's, that means a lot. Fiji has had fashion shows before, but they've mainly been local fundraising events. With this, Fiji joins a global trend and more than 100 countries which stage their own International Fashion Week. Bringing the designers out of their shells. They've been there for a long time, but nobody knew where they were. It's a break from the past, aimed at raising the profile of Fijian designers locally, but importantly, catapulting them overseas. You know, not a lot of them are ready for the international market, but by bringing down people who are fashionistas from the fashion industry international, hopefully they'll pick you know, not everybody, but one or two people and say, look, you've got potential. One of the country's established designers, Hupfield Herder, is proving Fijians can make it on the world stage. His creations have been showcased at a major Fashion Week event in the Bahamas, and he's just been invited to New York Fashion Week. My clothes is very focused on Pacific, Pacific and, and also Western women, who are not always at size 8, 10, 12, but who are actually um, rubinists who are very, um, uh, like, let's say, like filled out. Former Fijian world windsurfing champion turned designer Tony Filk set up his label in Paris, one which deliberately avoids a cliched look. We don't want to be seen as something that's too tropical, that's too, uh, that's too eth ethnic, that's too Fijian, uh, because if you want to sell Mount of Fiji to somebody living in New York, they need to be able to identify with it. Like with the shirt I'm wearing, you have a massy, massy print. Uh, these are the, the small, subtle touches that identify the brand with its specific origins. He's returning to Fiji to set up base and hopes to be part of the change he believes is necessary for the industry to take off. We're definitely behind the times here. I mean, that's that's obvious. You look around you. You know, we're in a very laid-back country. People tend to to dress down than dress up. So there was a whole mindset that you need to change here. We would like people to be bold enough to actually wear our vibrant colours. Sea blue, the tangerine orange and the green. Fiji's fashionistas are keeping an eye on Samoa, which has a number of successful labels based in New Zealand. The Samoa definitely has a huge advantage. Samoa has New Zealand and you know it's like a caretaker country for, for them. But that's why Samoa obviously precedes us. But you know, we, this, this Fashion Week is really going to show them up. With a little bit of help from some top New Zealand and Australian designers who ran workshops to help emerging designers. Peter Norton of the high-end Australian label Saba focused on marketing. I uh, spoke to the guys today around creative expression of ideas that is tangible to an editor or to a, uh, a fashion journalist or advertising campaign, something like that. Designer Elizabeth Finlay is behind New Zealand's Zimbizi label. I started very small without formal training. You know, the label has grown out of a passion for um, creating clothes. It's very much a design led business. And I think that I felt that people that were here today um, were very similar to myself um, in the early days, where they, they just have a passion to um, create and design and begin something, you know, start something. 
Fiji's Fashion Week is a showcase of the country's best designs. The organizers, designers and models put on a great show. But when it's all over, will it have any impact? Oh, I just want to see all those models in Paris. I want to see all those designers in internships all over the world. Because that's what we need. The Kingdom of Tonga is unique in the Pacific. It was never formally colonised and is the only country still ruled by royalty. In the Pacific's only monarchy, I got the chance to meet not one, but two very charming Tongan princesses. My name's a bit long, but it's um, Salote Lubipau Salmasina Purea Vahineri Ahaltuita. My name is Fanitipova Vau Tuivalano. I'm the eldest daughter of Her Royal Highness Princess Salo de Plolevo and Lord Duita. I'm the second daughter of Her Royal Highness Princess Plolevo and Lord Duita. Sisters Princess Lupe Pau and Princess Fane Tupo Uvavau are nieces to the King of Tonga. I met up with them for an interview at the palace office right next to the royal palace in Tonga's capital Nuku'alofa. And it didn't take long before we got on to the girl talk, family, dating and marriage. The um, first 20 um, in line to the throne um, have to marry within the nobility. Were your marriages arranged? Yes. Ideally you're supposed to be given a person or chosen a person for do you still need the king's approval for that? You need um, a document where he consents to it, then the marriage can proceed. It's a whole traditional cultural process. Mm. If you're a certain rank, then the courtship is prolonged. Mm. Um, there's a lot of going back and forth between various suitors, not just the one. Mm. And you don't really have to know them before you get married. But there is a Tongan way of dating, but it's very public and it's in front of all your family. Princess Lupe Pau was married in 2003 and Princess Fane Tupo in 2007. My husband's name is Gil and he's the eldest son of Lord de Mano. And they, they approached the traditional way as well. They made the approach and my family considered it, found it favourable, took it to the king and he gave his assent. And then we set the date. But uh, since then we've been very good friends. I was married. Oh. <laughs> Are you divorced? Yes. Is that a, a common thing or must be quite controversial? Very controversial. Um, it hasn't been done in our family before. I think I'm the first. Yes, yes. Uh, our family doesn't really, um, it's not quite acceptable to be divorced. Mm. So you managed to do that? Yeah. With no problems or problems? Um, or? Well, I think it has, it's a, has a lot to do with my character. Um, I didn't see something working and I wanted to fix it, so I fixed it on my own. Mm. It's acknowledged that um, we don't seek to promote it. Yeah. But it's the last resort, I think. I think we're very lucky we've, we've had um, very understanding parents. I think more understanding than most traditionalist parents, but um, they've been very, very supportive. They're happy with when we're happy, so that's the main thing. Thanks for watching Pacific Pulse, and we'll leave you now with more catwalk glamour, this time from New Zealand designers, merging Maori tradition with modern flair at the Festival of Pacific Arts in American Samoa. See you next time.